you. Thanks, everyone. I do appreciate that. I just didn't want to leave it all said. No, right. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with Alison. Alison Cole, you had your hand up when we finished the last item. I've not completed that item yet. I just want to gather some views, etc. Ali, you first, please. Thank Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to say that um, obviously it was very brave of Heather to tell us her story, her and David's story, and it was a very harrowing account. But for me, there's also something about how we try and prepare individuals to care for their loved ones at home if that's what they want. And actually, it's tough and you, they have to be brave. And she said that she called the ambulance because David couldn't stand and he couldn't speak. That isn't the answer. If people truly want to care for their families at home, we need to have a facility and a mechanism for helping them to, to support them to do that because it's tough. It's tough on the families and I don't know how we can effectively prepare families for that and not have, in a way, the knee-jerk reaction of, oh, my goodness, I can't cope with this. We need an ambulance. We need the hospital. Because in reality, they probably don't. They just need some additional support to enable them to keep that individual at home because it's hard and it's frightening. Yeah. That's all I wanted to say, Thanks. really. Thanks. Yeah, I'll take that as an observation. Thank you. Um, any other comments? I think as a board, we will probably want to discuss the what where we go next with this and the information we receive. So I, I wouldn't expect that to happen now, particularly uh, as we've just heard Heather's story. And, and there has been work done uh, since David died, but nevertheless, um, if colleagues are happy, I think we will do further work out this and then revisit this. Sarah? Yeah, I just wanted to reflect that the report in terms of actions very much focused on process and what would change and it didn't acknowledge that we fell short in terms of our compassion and how we cared for David and his and Heather. Um, and so when we do that reflection, we need to make sure we think about that as well. And that, that is part of our action. Plan. And, and again, I'm very comfortable and I know all of this up top that Heather wants to become involved and advise and observe and in effect, you know, try and get some response to the why questions that she asks. Aaron? Yeah. And I, I, I don't know whether it features within the action plan, and I know there will be a great deal of work going in the culture and, and about how people feel, because um, fundamentally that's really critical. So two things really. It's one, just particularly with ED in mind, and I know this recently because my sister had a brilliant experience, thank you, and um, recently, and fed back and took thank you cards and took chocolates back the next week and really expressed her thanks. And what she was really struck by is that the ED team were astonished that somebody actually went back and gave them some positive feedback. So I think there's something there for mm -hmm. us in terms of learning. And, and I think a second thing is I just wonder where professional accountability sits within this and how and the kind of it's the tough edge of tackling that in terms of for any of those people either in leadership role senior or middle or just the leadership role of being professionally accountable it's like are we actually addressing that as fully as as we need to because the, because this is not okay and um I mean, I, I, I just, it's the harder edge of it that we hear less about, I think. Use that in good your achievements work. work okay, I will do. Chief exec? Yeah, it's, a, it's a taking on your line just for a proposal for some space for the board. So we'd had a little conversation in the break about, I guess, that where the board's uh, visibility is on some of the key items and issues that we need to oversee for assurance and reassurance, whether it's performance, quality, safety, finance, our workforce, uh, and we align our resources, don't we, to improving in those areas of gaps. To good effect, we've seen good, good improvement, but we don't often have a way of checking in on compassion or culture or the way that those things are being delivered. 
and we rely quite a lot on complaints as a mechanism to judge how well those things are being delivered. And we do get some themes from complaints in here, but it's very rarely we unpack those to a degree that allows us to take any different action. The board's already committed resources to things like our cultural leadership programme, our values-based recruitment processes, the work we're doing under the focus management development programmes, and the induction programmes, they're all designed to develop a caring and compassionate under our values. That's that's what it's designed to do. And what we've heard today under David's story and Karen, you've articulated three to four years ago with your own story, that there are occasions where compassion falls well short in, in the way that we're delivering care. So my proposal is as a board, we have a conversation about culture. Uh, we check in as to how we know and what mechanisms we've got to measure or report or give assurance. And if we are falling short, then we can take a conversation into a, whether it's the IPR or something else, that we, we have a way of checking in on that as a board. Yeah. Colleagues, I'd probably just add on to the chief exec that we not only have a look at the compassionate culture and our values, but also standards. That we tie in, what do we mean by compassionate standards? Colleagues, happy if we explore that further. And I would like to formally thanks in the minutes uh, our chief nurse, Tabitha, for asking Heather to come and speak to the board. It's a difficult hearing it. And it's a real experience for Heather. David has died. I think it's right that these stories should come to the board and it's right that we hear these things and it's right that it's in a public board and that we're transparent and open and that we address where care doesn't meet the standards that we expect that we address it and we hear about it so i just want to formally thank the chief nurse for, for bringing that to the board's attention and we'll take action Chair, can I just say, should all staff see that? Because I don't think anybody could hear and, and not, not be moved, you know, because if you can't have compassion in that situation, I question really why you're a nurse. Well, I think that's a really good point about should everybody hear. What I was going to suggest was that we go away from this meeting. We've just heard it. We can come up with various uh, ideas about how we move this forward, but we come back to this asking the executives and the NEDs and the lead governor to join in with suggestions of what we could do with this information. And it fits in with this cultural review of compassion and, uh, and standards. And it may be that we say everybody hears these stories. So it's a sensible suggestion, Shirley Ann. I think it's just so powerful. I think we have that in the minutes as something that we will follow up when we ask the executives to say, well, what actions would we be required to do? Because there could be lots of things that we could look at as well. Follow along with it. Colleagues, I'll close that item then. And that we will follow it up. We on then to item five, the chair's report. Just before I go through the chair's report, I just want to give thanks, and there are some colleagues here today who are observing the board, to the shadow board that has been running for the past year. Um, we've had senior colleagues, directors, etc., who've been members of the shadow board. I've chaired it. I'd just like to give thanks formally in my chair's report to the members of the shadow board and their contributions that they've given to, to this board and also to the trust, the, the professionalism and the enthusiasm and the skills that, that members of the shadow board have shown has given me confidence really that we've got really, really excellent uh, senior staff. And I just want to formally thank those members of the shadow board because it formally ended yesterday. And I know there will be discussions with the chief exec and others about, well, how do we move forward with what we've learned with the shadow board? And maybe we look at uh, some other forms of assurance frameworks, et cetera. But just like to formally thank the shadow board members and those of you who are here. Thank you. OK, you've got my report and um, it speaks very much for itself. Um, some of the items there are on today's agenda. Um, so I think I will just answer any questions. 
before I end with a farewell to Adrian Leather, who isn't here. But any questions on my reach? <laughs> okay. I will like it minuted that Adrian has sent his apologies because he gets embarrassed by thanks. <laughs> <laughs> He's avoided this, I think. <laughs> I would like to just open the floor up. Adrian's been with us six years. He's um, He's been the chair of the People Committee, he's chair of charities. In his own professional role, he is the chief exec of Healthy Lancashire. So I would just like to minute our deepest thanks for his contribution in the last six years to, his, to this board and to the trust. His commitment to quality and assurance has really been outstanding. And I think we will miss him. We wish him the very best for the future. I'll just open the floor up in case anyone wants to say anything. Can I just say on behalf of the governors, I know that they would all want me to say a big thank you to Adrian for his support and, and his kindness, and he, he will be much missed. Thank you, Chair. Well, yeah, I'm the senior independent director. Thank you very much, Chair. <laughs> um, just echoing what Shirley Ann says, I mean, uh, the qualities of uh, Adrian are brilliant. I mean, he's just a great guy, but the thing I really like about Adrian is just a a good person, yes. good values. Yeah. Um, he's always looking out for others, and he's he, he to, for me when I started with others, he was very supportive and was there at the end of an email or or kind of seeing his conversation. So thank you, and I wish him the best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, hopefully you'll have some links with the NHS if we continue to see him. <laughs> okay, colleagues, are you happy to accept the chair's report? <laughs> yeah, we'll move on then to the chief exec's report. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, my report, as usual, talks at kind of reflections in three areas for the trust, the regional and the national position. Um, it's it's a difficult report to feedback after the story we've heard this morning, but it's important that we don't lose sight of the progress we're making, the improvements we're making, because it should fire our ambitions to move further through the organisation to identify and address issues like we've heard with Heather and David's story this morning. So. Um, just reflecting on the on the past year as we move into the new year, um, we delivered and our teams delivered under really difficult circumstances, including you know really tough winter, industrial action, uh, some of the biggest financial and operational challenges we've seen as a, as an organisation. Um, and at the end of that period, we've just had a report around our stroke services again that are double A rated across both our sites. Um, the execs were with the teams on Friday, kind of reflecting on, on that improvement. And what I liked most about the session I had at, at Barrow, two or three colleagues took the opportunity to accept that, yeah, there's some really good work done and A rating's great, but uh, not everywhere. And we've still got work to do in community. And we've still got to do work in therapies and the neuro support that we need for community um, colleagues that you've had strokes, et cetera, isn't where it needs to be. And, and that tenacity and integrity to not take that first level pass off mm -hmm. good gave me good confidence that for stroke services in particular, I can see that team chomping at the bit to go next level and on delivery. Um, one of the few NHS trusts that had um, no patients waiting over 65 weeks and a really strong plan this year to have no patients waiting over 52 weeks. Now, uh, that's quite an uh, embarrassing thing for me to say actually as a chief exec, given where I've been in my NHS career and what waiting times were pre-COVID, but that is orders of magnitude better than some organisations are doing and our waiting list is reducing as a result, which means patients in our communities are getting a better offer and a better service than, than we had done previously, which is great feedback. I could go on. So our cancer diagnostic standards being hit, our core diagnostic standards being hit. We've managed to invest really well in places like um, urology, oncology and our theatres environments, um, all against a full year impact of £31 million worth of savings. And it's only in the last one, two, three years that we've been able to tell that story of performance, quality, safety and money being a focus where we can give really lived experience in each of our services of improvements that are being made. And um, that's notwithstanding something I'm calling um, sweating the small stuff. We now need as a leadership team, and I've said this at our management groups and core briefings, to be curious at the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. So we don't just take the IPR on its core targets and we don't just take assurance or reassurance at assurance committee level until we're good at every ward, at every interaction every day, then our improvement work doesn't stop. Uh, which is why this year 
as a board, we will be facing some really difficult decisions again around how we set ourselves up, how our clinical services are structured, how our workforce is established. Um, and that's under our hand. Uh, it's a really different environment, Chair, of coming through COVID. It's quite um, permissive in terms of expected transformation and change. Being under the environment we had with soft form recovery support, we had external regulatory pressure to drive improvement. We are now talking to colleagues and patients and others about making step changes in transformation and restructure under our hand because we know it's what's needed next. So there's a, a difficult period coming, but some real confidence that actually the work we've done in the last two or three years is putting ourselves in a position where we should have confidence in pushing ourselves to go to go further. Um, just on the, the national updates, it's largely in the planning in the year end. Um, Board will be aware because we've approved and signed off our plans for this year. There is another planning submission due tomorrow. Um, our plan will not have changed. That is the plan that we've agreed. Uh, but we'll be talking both as a trust and with a system about what are the risks in that plan, particularly financially and operationally. How do we work with the provider collaborative and the system on mitigating those risks? How do we take steps early in this first quarter to address those risks as well as we can? So we've got good confidence for the year end. So there's a lot chair both nationally and regionally locally with, with that line of um, that line of inquiry a um, couple of updates in the system um, so obviously ICB board member one of the big um, issues to recognize a change in our system with the ICB is they've taken on board now specialist commissioning responsibilities so we have that complete commissioning oversight now in our system with one body um, we've been working with the ICB on their commissioning intentions they're shaping up really well it will sit alongside our own ambitions that Jane's leading on around clinical service transformation, clinical strategy delivery, so we can start to get a real clear plan over the coming months on what that looks like over the next two or three years, Chair. We've progressed our partnership um, relationships in this last period, both with the University of Lancaster and also uh, University of Cumbria, through the establishment of a more formal memorandum of understanding, codifying and writing down what we want this relationship to be uh, our width of the normal relationship chair around um, education, research, training, but also looking at opportunities around broader economic development, uh, population health improvement, recruitment and retention, net carbon zero. So I'm really pleased that we're moving into a bit more of a, a practical relationship, which is more broad with our, with our universities. Um, I've started to engage again in the trust in a slightly different way on that sweat in the small stuff platform, getting into some of the areas of the trust I haven't visited for a while. Um, I was on our Triple uh, CU unit, FGH, our clinical investigations unit, um, just taking a sense of where some of our teams that often don't get the visibility or awareness raised. Uh, fascinating, some great work going on in clinical investigations unit in particular, which I'll feature in a future report. Um, but yeah, that's as much as I wanted to be back, Chair, and um, I don't want us to lose sight of the good work, the good improvement in the platforms we created because it's going to give us a push into this next phase. But given the stories, we periodically hear about things not being good enough. That should find the appetite to get further into the organisation and make further improvements. Thank you. Comments or questions for the Chief Exec? Karen? <laughs> this one. Um, thank you and, and thanks, Aaron. And it's brilliant to see the um, improvement in stroke services and long may that be sustained but um, it just occurred to me that um, perhaps one of the aspects of that that we haven't heard so explicitly and it may not be for today but it's just what difference that makes to outcomes for patients so if we've got an A stroke service how does that translate into outcomes for patients that's better than a B so it's how do those how does that rating translate at, at patient level? What difference does it make? Would somebody know that that they were experiencing a service that was A or B and how might it impact for them? It's just getting a little, I know it can be a lot of detail for a strategic level, but it's, it feels really critical. Um, it's a direct correlation, Karen. So, um, the Sentinel audit data is focusing on measures that are demonstrably evidence based for improving outcomes and reducing harms when experiencing a stroke or a suspected stroke. So things like time to diagnosis, time to treatment, the therapy support you get in recovery, they're all directly attributable to improvements in outcomes and experience. Um, I'm aware that the Sentinel data set is changing. 
uh, they're going to be looking again at further evidence base of how we look at monitoring how well the service is doing. I know the team are working hard on mm -hmm. assessing how we do that and what improvements we need to make further on the basis of that data set. Um, but it would be helpful just to correlate that probably quality committee with some of the, the harms and the mortality data for a stroke, just to give that evidence base. It would help support the Sentinel for SNAP audit data. But uh, yeah, the, the audit is designed exactly to measure those processes and the measures that lead to those reduced harms and improved outcomes. Really helpful. Thanks. Just really important. That's explicit. I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments on the chief exec, please? No. Are you happy to accept the chief exec's report? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Then we'll move on to the head governor's report. Julianne, please. Take it as read. Take it as read. Any comments to the head governor? No. Happy to accept the report. I live for the day when somebody does make a comment. <laughs> you can all think about that. Don't challenge, shall we? <laughs> yeah, we work on that. <laughs> yeah. I'll come back. So we move on then to quality and safety, and we're on the maternity and neonatal update assurance report. Chief Nursing Officer and Director of Midwifery. Before we go into this item, Chief Nurse, I just uh, say to the board that the board of directors to note this report. But also note that some of the sub reports have already been scrutinised through the quality committee. Just check with the chair of quality. Anything to escalate from those reports? Uh, no, no. There's a couple of comments I'll make, but that's yeah. what you think. Fine, thanks. Great. Chief Nurse, please. Thank you, Chair. So this maternity and neonatal update is here for assurance in line with the. Uh, all the national guidance and recommendations and so just to make that clear that's why it comes to board and on that note i will introduce or bring in sue i think sue this is your first poll sue stansfield is our director of midway free and she's on the screen welcome to welcome to the board um, what we normally do is the chief nurse introduces the item and then the director of midway free takes us through the salient points and anything that needs to be brought to our attention and any escalation points, take into account the quality committee may have scrutinised it. So the floor is yours. When we finish soon and we get questions and answers and we come to the end of the item, I normally ask the chief nurse just to summarise and end the item. So that's the normal protocol. Thank you and thank you for that, Chair, and thank you for the introduction, Tabitha. Um, so I'm going to take the reports I've read and, as previously stated, they have been scrutinised through Equality Committee. So just two salient points I wanted to draw out of the report today. The first one, the bereavement suite at RLI, that I know has been raised a number of times at board. The plans are now finalised for the bereavement suite and... Alison Cole and I was at uh, the Maternity and Neonatal Voice Partnership meeting on Monday, the quarterly meeting, and we've shared those plans now um, with our service users uh, to get any feedback. There's a number of families who want to work with us on the developments around the bereavement suite. We should get the final costings back from estates and facilities uh, week commencing the 6th of May, and then we'll be able to progress the business case. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to draw to the report. The second thing that you're not used to seeing as part of this report is the sustainability plan, which is at Appendix 3. Um, so Appendix 1 and Appendix 2 you get on a regular basis. Appendix 3 is a, a new addition to the report. The sustainability plan is part of our exit criteria for the Maternity Safety Support Programme. The plan has been shared with colleagues from the Maternity Safety Support Programme with the Regional Chief Midwifery Office and also um, with ICB colleagues as well. But I'm happy to take any additional questions or comments. OK, I'll, I'll start, colleagues, if that's OK. Um, so the bereavement suite at RLI, um, we've shared the plans on Monday. What are the date lines for that? 
So once we've got the costings, which I said we commence in the 6th of May, once all those have been uh, finalised, we'll be able to put those into the business case and then take the business case forward towards the end of May. Um, the business case has already largely been developed. It is just waiting for those final costings to go in it. Yeah, I think my question is, so when do you think the, God forbid, but a grieving parent would be using the suite? Will it be this year? If the business case is accepted, then we'll have to work towards uh, timelines of getting those uh, those changes made and those developments made. Uh, and uh, I have no idea from an estates and facilities point of view how long it would take to do those alterations. Okay, so can I just ask then, and God forbid, but if there is a, a, a bereft parent, will they be seen at RLI? Will they be supported at RLI? Will their families and carers, or will they be transferred to Barrow? We're, we're offering families the choice currently. Um, so the, while the bereavement suite's been closed, we've offered families if they would like to take the bereavement suite at South Lakes Birth Centre at Barrow, if it's available, then that option is available. Alternatively, we support them at RLI. So they are given an option. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Yeah, thank you. The other key point I wanted to pull out was um, just around breastfeeding. So what we saw in the IPR is that really we plateaued in terms of take breastfeeding um, in hospital and then at discharge, um, and it's below the national standard. Um, it also came through as a theme in the maternity survey results that we had, um, where an area for improvement was identified as infant feeding information being provided during the antenatal period. So we did discuss this um, at Quality Assurance Committee um, and uh, Sue updated us that breastfeeding is an area of focus for this year um, and with the ambition to, to attain level two for breastfeeding support um, and that the maternity and neonatal um, voices partnership would lead on developing that and uh, testing what's needed with uh, with mothers. Um, but I want to check if Sue wants to add anything to that. Uh, so the only thing to add is that we have actually been back to the teams and asked the teams to relook at that data just to triangulate it back to make sure because there is more than a 20% difference. We wanted to make sure that that data is, is actually accurate as well. So we are doing that sense check um, just on the back of those questions being raised at Quality Committee to make sure that it isn't a recording issue. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Who's Sakthi then yourself, Karen? Sakthi, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I was also going to pick up on that data. It didn't look like a um, reason for concern, but clearly it was reported like that. Um, just also to highlight, so uh, in the community, we've just been um, having UNICEF inspection, uh, and we have uh, had the gold accreditation for baby friendly that includes breastfeeding. Fabulous. So if there is any learning that we can um, support with from the community, uh, I'd be delighted to make the relevant connection so we can get back this performance on track. That would, that would be great. Thank you so much for that offer. That's really very much appreciated. Thank you. Aaron? Oh, thank you. And I appreciate this may have been covered already in the Quality Assurance Committee. It's just really a question about the first case that met the MS, uh, MNSI criteria, where there was no home birth cover on the evening the woman went into labour. Um, I'm just wondering, do we have the data or do we have a record of how frequently that might happen for women when they're planning a home birth, but actually there isn't cover for them to go ahead as planned? So we have started to look at that data more recently and um, and to take that into consideration. All the all the service users are communicated with if we haven't got home birth cover and what that means. And we are hoping to work with this family. So we're going to have a roundtable discussion. This lady has now consented for an MNSI investigation, but we're also going to try and sit and have a roundtable discussion about what happened with this case when the uh, when the home birth cover wasn't available. 
and uh, if I might add, if it's possible within that to include the frequency with which that might occur, that would Absolutely. just be really helpful insight. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Alison, do you want to say anything? I was just coming off mute. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we did mention about the um, we did mention about the uh, breastfeeding in the uh, maternity forum. Um, and as Sue said, we're not confident in the data. Um, so we need to see what that shows us. Sue's updated on the bereavement suite. Um, thank you for your comments about the timeline, because if you hadn't have said it, that would be the next thing on I would be pushing would be for the uh, for the timeline of when it can happen, assuming the business case is passed. Um, I did speak with the bereavement midwife at the maternity and neonatal uh, partners, voices partnership uh, meeting on Monday. Um, and they are acutely aware that the provision we're able to provide at RLI is not consistent with what's available at South Lakes Birthing Centre. And whilst um, families are offered the choice of using that suite at South Lakes, if their family networks and support is Lancaster based, then it's a hard choice to make because not all families can travel through to Barrow. So there really is a need to expedite the works once we get the full costings through, um, because I think the the um, psychological impact um, is significant to those families. And I think I've said before, I certainly said it at the Maternity Safety Champions, whilst the risk of the bereavement suite being closed, the physical risk to mothers has been reduced because they're cared for in an environment where there are, is emergency access should should it be required the psychological impact is not diminished if anything it's increased because they're in delivery suites where they can hear all the comings and goings so i'm not assured by the reduction in risk and impact on families due to the closure of the bereavement suite okay from a physical aspect it's reduced but from a psychological aspect it is certainly isn't so we we need this scheme to happen thank you thank you and then the final comment from me then so when when the data comes forward on breastfeeding and physiotomies etc do we also include what's happening in the actual sector itself? Are our figures comparable with other trusts, with other maternity units? Do we have that in the data? Certainly within Lanx and South Cumbria, we would have, be able to have that data to compare ourselves with the other, the other units. Um, so yes, we can do that measure. Yeah, please, cause, cause, because we have basically different hospital sites, there's always a danger that we either aggregate two sites or we we look at two sites as though they're one, but actually they're separate. And we can lose as well what's happening either regionally or nationally about what would be the comparable and acceptable uh, data that we can use. So thank you for that. Sarah. Thank you. You add to that we we do see the variation by site uh, so we do see that within the trust and then we also um, have, have the tables in oh, certainly half of them which show um whether we're an outlier um compared with other trusts and um, which then enables more more of deep dive to assess whether there are particular things driving that so that is something we do see yeah, a decision that's good that's reassurance okay any further comments on the report itself are you happy to approve the report? Yeah, and then just so that we're clear with the minutes, I'll take the, the sub items as well. So 8-1, the attained report, we know it's gone through quality. We're asked to note the content and agree the recommendations. Yeah. Equally for two CQC NHS maternity service survey, we're asked to receive the report and advise an update. Yeah, happy with that. It's part of the report that you've just given to 
In the free workforce review, we're asked to approve and take assurance that there's an ex effective system for workforce planning from the chair of quality. Yeah, and, and we did discuss this and also um, ask that question again, given that the report shows that our bill rates um, or our establishment rate is below our funded establishment um, vacancies. We sought assurance that we do maintain safe staffing throughout for, for officer babies and um, through the measures that are taken in terms of agency and, and, and bank. We do ensure safe staffing and also moving staff around. So, so you would support the recommendation? Yeah. Thank you. And then the obstetric medical workforce review, again, for information and assurance of progress. Sarah? Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so we, we did discuss this. Uh, what you'll notice, it does show we're non-compliant with um, the some of the our COG, so the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, <laughs> um, guidance on compensatory rest. Um, there's a robust action plan which is inclu was included and which we reviewed. And um, we've also been assured that that would make us compliant for year six requirements for paternity um, uh, criteria as well as part of CNST. Um, so we, we took assurance from that. And as long as we continue to make good progress with that action plan, then we will be compliant for that action. Thank you. So therefore, you recommendation. Colleagues happy to accept the recommendation. Chief Exec. Chair Pacaccio, um, I think we're at an important time in terms of the maternity improvement work. And I'm really grateful, Sue, for your leadership and the, the strength that you bring into the team. I think the levels of scrutiny that the board apply through the quality committee, particularly on that sustainability plan and the workforce reviews, are going to be critical ahead of the national review meeting that we've got planned for the end of May. So it may well be, Sue, Tabitha, that we just spend a bit more time the next couple of weeks, probably with yourself, Sarah, just making sure that everyone's aligned to that assurance on the sustainability plan before we get to the national review meeting. Uh, and I know, Sue, in particular, you've got some lines of inquiry, haven't you, about the difference between safe staffing and what happens when the staffing can be covered, but it means there's a service reduction, particularly for home births or helm chase or some of the other areas. So it's just to be aware with the board that there's a wider um, inquiry now around staffing for maternity that Sue's leading on really well and, and came to exec team yesterday just to, just to kind of draw that out a little bit. Sure. Yeah, happy to accept that. Sue, anything else you wish to add? No, no, thank you very much. Thank you. It's good to meet you. Welcome to the first board. Thank you. Chief Nurse, anything you wish to add? Or? No, just to say thank you, Sue, for your wonderful work and contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. See you again next, well, in the next board meeting, if not before. <laughs> OK, colleagues, we'll move to item nine. Transformation and Improvement. This is an update on the Transformation and Improvement Board, and it's almost a transitional report because we will get a further update for sign off in July. So just keep that in mind. The terms of reference, etc., are yet to come to us. I'll ask the Deputy Chief Executive to present and ask us what you would like the board to do with this report this morning, please, Chris. Thanks, Chair, for noting and um, uh, any any questions, obviously, but uh, what I'd say, uh, just a couple of contextual points around this. I just want to explain um, a little bit of context, which will help um, understand the report, I think. So firstly, in respect to the closure of um, the old RSP, the Recovery Support Programme work streams, all work streams have now submitted the relevant reports that will enable us to conclude that process. This report um, I hope in part provides uh, not just an update on the process, but demonstrates that they, they are live issues. Uh, RSP workstreams, whilst they may close, the issues continue. They continue to be reviewed. Um, and um, we're working hard to ensure that that closure and handover is done as effectively as possible. So this report does show a little bit of insight into the review process that supports uh, the closure and hope uh, uh, provides some insight and assurance to that. Sustainability reviews are part of the assurance that we build around the closure of that. So once a, a, um, a work stream is closed, uh, we continue to just check on process firstly to make sure that all of the judgments that we made when we agreed to close the work stream were right, but also that the business as usual 
processes that we transfer to are operating as intended. Um, so that's just a little bit of context. Now, and part of the report also reflects uh, or reports the um, position around the current uh, transformation improvement um, priority work streams. So the transformation improvement board in May does represent a key milestone in our plans for the year, as we'll receive and review the full benefits realisation plans. Now, um, what I would look to be doing uh, at that point, Chair, should the agenda permit, uh, is that I'd be looking to prepare a supplementary presentation for the board at this point either for the part two meeting or or, or another session um but i think that's a point at which we would want to share um, a fair bit of detail to supplement the assurance you get in the standard update reports uh, that's it for me chair i'm happy to take um, any questions i'll start first again colleagues that's all right thank you for the report chris because we've been tracking this we are aware of this development and you know, the paper is, as you contextualised it, I just wondered when you come back in July, if you could give a diagrammatical presentation of the assurance framework and how it fits in so that colleagues around the tables can actually get a, a pictorial image of how the, the, TIB, the TIB is in effect, split into two different functions so that we can just get a clear idea. I'm conscious that this is a public board meeting, and I think if, if the members of the public are observing this, they, this would be slightly confusing because we know this progression is ongoing. But I think it would be useful just for the board records and board papers if you could just give a diagram so that we can see where it all fits, please. All right, Chris. Yeah, yeah, Chair, it would be really timely to do that. In fact, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on that uh, in the last few um, few weeks. Thank you. I'll open it up, colleagues. It is an update paper. We will come back to it after the May meeting and then in July. We're happy to accept the update report. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Stay with us because we're moving on to the performance and resources now. Uh, item 10.1, Integrated Performance Dashboard, month 11. Over to you. Chair, um, I'm not in the room, so I think uh, for the ease of the presentation, if we get straight into the sections and um, we start off with um, uh, the Chief Nurse and uh, Medical Director and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Quality and Safety section. Okay, Chief Nurse first then, please. Thank you, Chair. So in terms of our patient safety incidents, uh, we've had low size incidents uh, over the month of February because these are February figures. And we're moving away from the size reporting framework into our PSAF framework. Um, and under that kind of framework, we've initiated as an organization three patient safety incident investigations under what is referred to as a patient safety incident. PSII. So if you see PSII, it stands for, for that under PSAF. So we have got those three ongoing. In regards to complaints, um, we had had the past story, it came from complaints. And I am sort of comfortable to say we have got no complaints at the moment exceeding six months um, at the end of February and none since December. So we're really doing a lot of work on that. But if I may add, Chair, to note that our POWs needs attention because we're having quite a lot of POWs um, creeping up um, and there is work ongoing in the background and I can give an update at next board. Uh, in terms of our falls, uh, we've seen a kind of going down in terms of our slips, trips and falls. We've had 104 out of the 104, 42 of them were recorded as recurrent fallers, um, five moderate harm and 99 no injuries. And most of our fallers are within the frailty and our elderly patients. And we continue to monitor this through our fundamentals of care um, initiative. Pressure ulcers, we've had 47 under category two. Within that category, one was unstable, which means we didn't know which category to put it into either one or two because of the scars over the, the pressure ulcer. 
um, and it's good news to report that we've got no three or four because then those fall into a kind of our safeguarding uh, bracket. Family and friends test is still an issue because we hover around the 12% and 13%. And for February, we are at 13%. Our target is 14%. Another area where we're doing a lot of work and looking at whether friends and family test um, the framework that we use, whether it's working for us or whether we need to look at some kind of digital um, app for patients, which may be easier. So we are exploring that to see if we can improve the feedback. But whilst we move from friends and family to the app, there will be a risk that maybe our feedback will go down a bit just to make a note for that. Uh, in terms of our mixed sex breaches accommodation, um, we have had 40 in month. Um, and all these are related to ITU step downs. There is a change in the reporting guidance for mixed sex breaches because previously we were reporting that if there is a ward of five and we put one male, we just count the one male. But now if we put one male onto a female, we have to say we've breached six. Does that make sense? So there is some kind of reporting guidance changes. So you probably see um, these numbers going up a bit because of those um, changes. Um, and then IPC, we have got a few hospital onset acquired. Uh, infections around C. diff. We've seen six cases. Um, e. coli counted for 10. Uh, we haven't had any MRSA. MSSA, we've had five. And there is a lot of work happening around IPC, around retraining, around doffing and donning, how we wear um, our protective clothing. And I have had no IPC lead for quite a few months. So hoping that I'll have a new IPC lead starting soon, which will help us to support the team to continuously improve and um, make sure that we maintain safety around those infections. And I will pass over to the Chief Medical Officer for VTE and mortality. Thank, Thank you. you. So, sorry. Um, so um, VTE, um, we're still not where we want to be with BTE. We had a long discussion in a paper at quality committee that was uh, thoroughly discussed. There have been a number of actions uh, and we do see improvements in, in particular areas that were, were a problem, but overall we're not yet there. Um, so there, there are a number of things going on, including some more um, focused uh, PMO type support. And um, because we've thrown lots of things at it, I'm not sure we know what's actually sticking. Um, so we have to move more forward with that. Uh, mortality, um, we've had no alerts for a little while, um, but in um, uh, February, our fractured neck of femur uh, had an amber alert, which has been green now for uh, a good a good number of months. Um, it uh, appears to have been um, expected raised, expected, sorry, raised numbers of deaths compared to expected in, in three particular months. Um, and the, there is a, a fractured neck of femur work group who will be working through that. Um, but um, there's that. And then the second one was a, a new alert. We had to go and do some work around what it was because it just said um, conduction disorders. It relates to heart block. Um, the coding is correct. So we, it was it was uh, real. Um, but um, when we've looked at them, uh, actually four of the patients alerted didn't die in a hospital setting. Um, five of them did die in hospital. And when they've looked at them, actually some of the patients were too frail to undertake um, pacing and, and have the treatments that you would normally do. Um, so I, th I suspect that that we, uh, whilst we've got a real number, um, the reasons for them uh, not having the treatment are entirely reasonable. Um, and that is reducing in the subsequent data. Um, I know Amita is on the call if there's any further questions that uh, we can answer, but uh, overall our mortality uh, remains below expected. Chris, back to you to orchestrate, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's um, over to Rebecca, who's here, I, I believe, for Chief People Officer today. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Just a, a couple of areas to highlight, please. So I'm looking at the progress towards the absence target. 
um, and particularly noting the time period during which that improvements occurred. It's been a real focused, um, I guess, collaborative effort between operational managers, people services and occupational health um, to identify the right outcomes for our colleagues who are on long term sick. Um, so the next six months for us will focus on uh, the same oversight of short term sickness. Um, and then moving on to the core skills framework, um, again, showing improvement there. Just to note that organisationally will be compliant with the um, requirement to adopt the national content by the end of June. So we're on track to achieve that and do that. Um, and then just to mention the appraisal compliance, again, showing uh, positive improvement. Um, and to, to note that we are looking at introducing a quality measure to sit alongside the compliance measure. Um, so we're working on a, a feedback tool for appraisees. So going forward, IPRs should reflect the compliance rate and the quality um, measure as well. That's all, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. So um, we'll, do, we'll take finance now, Chair. So um, it's a strange uh, period for fi finance, as you could imagine, because I've now uh, seen the, well, we have submitted the draft financial statements for the year end since this uh, report was produced. Um, so uh, the, the external audit is now underway, of course, so any, any uh, figures reported are now um, are, are still in draft. The report in the pack identified a risk to the revised year end deficit target of £5.6 million at the end of February. Now, this risk reflected the scale of sc stretch improvement targeted by the trust in the November year end forecast resubmission and, and the impact of some additional pressures which emerged over the uh, last five months of the year. In our draft financial statements, the trust did mitigate. Uh, the identified risk by 3.6 million uh, and therefore the we are reporting a draft year end deficit of 13.9 million against a 11.9 million pound revised deficit target of course subject to audit all of this will be formally reported through the uh, finance performance committee and audit committee through into the board in July one other point that's in the report is performance against the trust cost improvement plan which is reported at 87 percent of target within the integrated performance report this does re represent significant delivery against a very high target but i want to um, bring uh, advise the board that this does exclude a number of non-recurrent savings which have been achieved in addition to that this year we focus very heavily on recurrent savings in our reporting because we're determined that we maintain our focus on improving our underlying financial position as that this is the route to financial sustainability and on a recurrent basis the trust delivered almost 102 percent of its 30 million pound savings target in 23 24 and i think it's important the cost improvement performance considered in that uh, context um, oh, they were the main points I wanted to raise, Chair, so um, I will hand over to the Chief Operating Officer. Thanks, Chris. Um, Aaron's covered many, much of what I'm, I, I was going to say, but I will say around performance in his opening, and, and rightly, um, but, and I think often at this section um, we do put the caveat and also rightly that we're about to talk about performance, and in this instance celebrate performance where there are still thousands of patients waiting too long for stuff. And so that caveat remains important, particularly given the, the, the story we heard this morning. Um, but I think to give kind of new accolades to our teams, I will reflect on the year end performance and, and where we've got to uh, by our own benchmark and against other benchmarks. So um, if you heard about stroke, um, you've heard the validated um, snap position of um, an A at Furness and an A at RLI in Q3, which we rightly celebrated. Um, the unvalidated data for Q4 is it will retain that A RLI and the FGH will be a B. Um, the, I would describe that if it was on an SPC chart as normal variation. So to score an A is a score of 81 out of 100 or above. Uh, in scoring the A in Q3, we scored 82. Um, in Q4 unvalidated, we scored 79. So it's a very, very fine line between the, the A and the B threshold. Um, and the, the, the thing that is the metrics that have shifted that around 30 hours, which we've discussed many times at board, and uh, particularly um, at the barrel end of the patch, um, 
difficulties in therapy recruitment. Um, diagnostics. Um, so we're now 14 consecutive data points um, ahead of the target um, and put, put really helpful benchmarking in the IPR when, uh, in the reporting period, sixth out of over 110 trusts in England. So we rank sixth nationally in diagnostics, which is an outstanding achievement and likely contributes to the next domain, which is cancer. So in the pack in the February performance, we were ahead of target in two of the four cancer um, metrics. Um, really pleased to say that um, by the 30th of March, um, we had um, surpassed all four cancer targets. So it was a huge accolade to our teams. There are few trusts that are in that position, which is why we're in the first or second quartile nationally um, and the first or second of our nine national peers. And that stands for 28 days, 31 days, 62 days, and patients on the list beyond 62 days. For access to elective care, again, as Anne said, um, the, uh, we did achieve um, uh, zero 65 week capacity breaches. Um, that was not in the bag in Q3, and, and so our teams did an enormous amount of work. Uh, and Jane Tabitha and I have written personal notes out to individuals and teams to thank them for the, the efforts to achieve that. And not only that, the, the line of sight and the annual plan to achieve 52 weeks. Um, we are in the top quarter for RTT, although some way from the national 92% uh, standard. Um, I think the best assurance for the board that we are on track with that um, is the reduction in the waiting list size. And um, that's on page 287 of the pack that continues. Um, and that we've got the second highest rates of patient initiated follow up in England. Um, but not sitting on those laurels, to Adam's point earlier, and the current 11% PIFU rates, we're going to set ourselves a stretch goal this year to get that up to 15%, and we should make us the best in England in that metric. Uh, urgent care, I want to spend just a bit of time on urgent care. Um, so the sustained uh, uh, ongoing very high level of performance in our urgent community response. Um, the benchmarking remains real and transparent and consistent in the pack that says for uh, type one performance across the trust, um, as we have been for the last couple of years, um, we are second quartile in England and first of our peer group of nine. For our performance in February was 71.9%. Uh, um, it got more pressured in March. Um, having just finished um, April at midnight, um, the performance for April was uh, unvalidated over 76 percent, 76.2 uh, for April. Um, as the board's aware, um, going back to immediately following the pandemic, RLI um, is the, the biggest contributor to the level of performance we see in, in urgent care. So we've seen significant sustained improvements in FGH. The FGH hit the 76 percent. Uh, for our access 10 of 12 months last year. Um, it's been, it was at 86% for April, um, and last week was at 92%. So FGH has in, 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 done an excellent job um, in sustaining us for our access. RLI has run chronically between 55 and 60% for the last few years. Did see a deterioration in, in March to the low 50s. And so we have escalated now, um, and there is now a exactly an escalation meeting with the care group and the ED triumvirate from RLI on a monthly basis um, to secure improvement. We've sought some external clinical help for that, um, and we'll report more of that back as time goes on. Um, but a real focus on RLI ED as, I guess, the, the single outlier in the otherwise um, good balance score card for performance. Thank you. Okay, that completes the report, Chris. Yeah. That's right, Chair. Thank you, Scott, for differentiating as well between our two UECs because we want to mask away the aggregated figures. So thank you for that. Going to open it up. Any questions or comments, colleagues? That was the Chief Exec. I'll go Sarah, then Karen. Thank you. So it's a, it's a reflection for the quality and safety domain. Um, around how we are reporting against some of those core metrics. So if I draw a distinction between the comparative data and the SPC focus in our performance, it feels more like we're just quoting figures and numbers of how many falls we've had, how many infections, how many, but I've lost sight then of trajectories of improvement, levels of assurance, programmes of work to improve. So I think it would be helpful in future reports if we've got that, for falls, if it's 104, what 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 would be acceptable and what we aim 
looking to achieve, same for pressure ulcers. Similar for VT, although I know there's a lot more work gone into trajectories and oversight and quality committee. I'm still not assured that we've got that good understanding of cause and effect to get to a trajectory. And I can hear that from yourself, Jane. It feels it's hard to pin down the actions and effect, but we probably need to hold that discomfort for a bit longer until that's resolved. So a reflection, Chairman, and ask for the next report through the IPO. Yeah, thank you. Sarah? Thank you. That follows on really neatly then, Aaron, actually, because I was going to comment specifically on BTE. I think Anita would be able to confirm to you we had quite a tough discussion yeah. actually at the Quality Assurance Committee about this fact that, that we're stuck and actually when you look at the data going forward we've, we've dipped a bit but we chose not to spuddle mm -hmm. um, and just see where we got to and um, I think in addition to what Jane's talked about that we were dissatisfied as well that we needed to have another look at the data in terms of what was driving it because that's something that has been going on for quite a long time so actually a discussion about how we really get to the bottom of the the bi uh, business intelligence data was really important we also talked about um uh, sort of actually understanding at an individual level where some of the challenges were and that's something that's been going on and um, as part of the or internal audit for 24-25, there's also um, a, an internal audit around the um, WHO checklist. Um, so looking at compliance with those procedures um, that we go through. So it, it was certainly um, not something that we took at just at the value of, of the report. We have quarterly reports on BTE, we'll continue to receive those. And we discussed some additional actions that, that were going to be taken as well. Karen? Oh, thank you. Um, one for Tabitha, one for Jane and one for Scott, if that's OK. So um, just for Tabitha, just thinking about forms, Tabitha, I'm, I'm thinking back to the sad story we heard this morning and, and David's fall in EV while he was being um, overseen by a security guard. It's just... How confident are we that all of the reports that are, all the falls are happening are being recorded? Um, my response would be, I think I am comfortable. And we have what we call an executive review group that looks at all the falls and we do this twice a week to look at all the incidents that are happening on the wards. And that includes falls, that includes pressure houses, that includes any incident, including death. And we find out learning and we do some kind of thematic reviews where if an area needs support or training or learning, we sort of commission that. So from the governance processes that we have in place, I can assure the board that I am confident of what I hear. What I don't know, I don't know, I don't think if anybody's kind of hiding something, I wouldn't know. But with the governance processes that I've got, I am assured that I do know what I need to know. Thank you. And, and um, with VTE in mind, I know there's just so much work, and I know Amita is just so focused on this, um, and, and, and it's an enduring challenge. I just wonder, do we have data that helps us understand the implications of not having that VTE assessment. So if the assessment doesn't happen and then the treatment doesn't happen, do we know when that actually results in patient harm? Have we got that story that tracks through? So uh, I mean, oh, she's on hold, she said she's obviously new to good work us. So we do have on our um, uh, information available, we have um, not only uh, VT assessment done, but I, I presume that we also have VT um, treatment, wherever that is, on that. Um, we don't see a lot of reported incidents of VTs. We do get incident reports. It isn't high, um, and and we would be seen and picking those up. So, admittedly, some of those, um, you know, maybe out of VT, we don't get that report back in. Um, but we're not seeing lots of incidents of uh, VTs that we then trace back. So we. So try and find it all run together. Thank you. If I can add to that, actually, in the quarterly report we just received, they've been in look at the data in terms of hospital acquired thrombosis, um, and the reporting period the quarter I had not seen any uh, uh, incidents of hospital acquired thrombosis, which provides some, provided some assurance that whilst BTE 
um, I think we said VT or through Sabina's thromboembolism um, uh, was, was was not 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 where it needs to be in terms of of compliance. But what we weren't seeing from a hospital required thrombosis related to that. Thank you. I'm conscious I've strayed into some. That's a plenty of rest of the insurance committee there. And one last one, if I can, for Scott. Um, it's great to hear about the improvement in um, DNA and waiting lists and uh, patient initi initiating to follow up. And just is that data that you're able to look at through a population health lens? Is is, and if I showed you my objectives for this year, um, okay. <laughs> one of my individual objectives is around um, reducing ENAs specifically in the um, lower one or two economic quintiles. Um, so with the help of Chris Chisler, you've met um, them here. Um, it's, so my personal objective, more importantly, part of the outpatient transformation programme with expert people around it, we are doing a focused piece of work on not only presenting those data, but targeting a reduction in specific quintiles based on the health inequality data we've got. Fantastic. Look forward to hearing more about that. Thanks, Scott. Colleagues, Tom? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, two lines of inquiry for assurance. Just on mixed sex accommodation, um, we've heard about the change in methodology and, 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 and this has been consistent, but could you just reassure the board that with regards to the methods or processes used to ensure that obviously mixed sex accommodation when issues arise that the rights and individual needs of the individual patients are properly represented and advocated for and then secondly has anything come up in complaints in regards to this issue so thank you Tony. not i've not seen any complaints in regards to no. the issue um but you raise a very good point to see whether um, the patients who are moving into those mixed sex will probably need to do a bit more work in terms of their needs or preferences or where they want to go. I can pick that up and look into it. Thank you, Chair. And then the second point was just about time to hire. Um, we're in the lowest quartile uh, compared to peers, and it talks in the body of the report about some mitigations being planned. It was just to get assurance as to when we think those mitigations will come online um, because it's a Competitive work employment market, so just to understand what the improvements yeah. might be. When. We're, we're actively sort of working on that at the moment, so we, we update our IPR and it will include more specific information from our recruitment system around the time for each particular element of the recruitment process, so we'll be able to pinpoint exactly um, where any delays are in that process, whether it's in the operational side of recruitment or with shortlisting, for example. Um, so that will that information will be in the next iteration of our IPR. The, the action is current. And presumably, Chair, that, if I can ask, that will go back to the, the People's Committee. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. I just asked a couple of quick question. Just talking about male female beds. Is there a policy in regard to trans people? You know about where they're comfortable being. I have not come across that. No, I just, it, yeah. I just think it, it is going to be the mixed thing. Yeah, I'll pick it up uh, in line with what Tony has just asked, mm -hmm. and I'll have a look at that. Thanks, Tapa. A couple of questions for me, Tapa. Again, around the mixed sex accommodation breaches. The NHS constitution consultation document is now out. There's been a consultation period, I think, for about eight weeks. And in there, it says that the if the consultation uh, suggests it, they, they're going to really come down much, much harder on breaches of mixed sex. So are we prepared for that? Are we getting ready for, because it does seem to happen on a regular basis. Uh, what assurance we got that this is somehow going to get less? One firstly to the question, I forgot Lynn was on there, we have a transgender policy. Um, so, in line with that policy, then um, I can be assured that we have the policy and we can implement it safely. So, going to your question, how assured are you? I don't know, Mike, I'll have to look into it. That's the yeah, it's fine. Thank you. My, my next one's for Scott. I, I looked at the falls data for the past year, you know, and it's, it's not consistent. It, it, 
but higher than what we said it would be. And if you map that on the not meeting the criteria to reside, there's it looks like there's a correlation there between patient falls and patient stays. Is there any movement at all on the not meeting the criteria to reside? Are we, are we we're going to bring it down to 12% and 8%, 5%? Are we going to be stuck around 18 to 20%? Um, so, so to your first point, Chair, the, the, I don't know there has been a paper to quality committee around potential correlation or not around hospital acquired harms and um, NMCQR. Um, you, the direct answer to the first part of your question, has, has there been a movement? No, um, it still sits between 16 and 19 percent, um, as you see from the, the IPR. Um, has the I'm not even sure if this is reassuring actually, but has the conversation moved on? Most definitely. So there's we've now got a different granular set of actions between the local authorities and ourselves around NMC to R. So we feel more comfortable aligning to a trajectory towards only 12% in the first instance and then further. Um, there are things that we can, and it's certainly recent changes in recent conversations with local authorities in, in this very room looking at patient level detail and um, there are things we can do particularly in our therapy space and the risk appetite of some of our therapy decision making um, and some of the uh, decisions we make which make it difficult sometimes impossible for the local authority to deliver an action so um, Tabitha's um, uh, and team are arranging a very quick kind of therapy summit to start to get into that what three or four things could we do with our therapists things like um uh, patient homes being cleaned um uh, remote monitoring at home um the requirement for therapy assessment in hospital there are things we can do which will contribute to a big waterfall chunk on the trajectory so has it moved no are we committed to the trajectory towards 12 and then towards five yes there are things we can do internally have we got stuff lined up yes but i wouldn't offer assurance to the board that that's at this point going to materially make the impact we wanted to. Two questions then. Are there timelines associated with this? Will we see an improvement by August or September? And my second question is, what can we do as a board? Do we need to write to anyone or do we need to contact anyone? Is there anything we can do as a board to try and move this along? Because it, it the danger is it's becoming common practice, it's becoming normalised. And mm -hmm. when you look at the data compared to other trusts, we are, we are out of sync with that 18 to 20 percent, you know, the highest. We are. Um, so, uh, are the time was to specific pieces of work. Um, so, we want to commit to the numbers based plan with the local authorities and internally next week in this room. Um, to this summit uh, for therapies arranged for later this month. Um, the, when can we commit to plan confidently that it would get to twelve percent? I would say we want to be see that level of change prior to September, um, so that we're prepared for winter. So that should be our ambition, um, and that's certainly I I would only take as reassurance the fact that we'll have a trajectory that says here's nineteen, here's twelve, here's the chunks of the waterfall that will get us there by September. So yeah. that, that will be the product that, that I'm seeking. And in terms of escalation, I think it's 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 very, very well rehearsed and minuted in multiple fora, up to including ICB chief executive, IAGs, um, multiple uh, exec led groups, um covering transformation board, which has also got non exec attendance. So I'm at a loss as to where else we could take that. Um, what I would say is that there may have been a point where that escalation would have been about getting people to the table more meaningfully. I, I'm much more confident um, that we've got that conversation going now. So I would I would say that the, now your challenge rightly will be well, what's the so what and, and rightly so. But I, I don't think we're looking to unlock getting people to the table, which might have been an issue a year ago. I think that's that has improved. It's never getting the rubber on the road and to get that in and out of that this month with numbers for September. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other comments? No? 
colleagues. Sorry, uh, sorry, Captain. Sorry, Chair. Mine is just for clarity. Uh, we have a fundamentals of care report that goes to court every quarter. And I just want to ask the CEO if he wants that here and board with the IPR because it has the improvement work that's happening around the falls, pressure in in kind of qualitative. Should we so, take it off? Yeah, yeah. There's an action, isn't there, about the IPR reset and the refresh? So yeah. I'd like to incorporate it as part of that conversation. Okay. If it isn't appropriate to put it at that level of detail, then I'd love for the trajectories to inform the narrative through quality committee to inform me rather than extra reports to the board. Oh, thank you. Just wanted that clarity. Thank, thank you. you. Colleagues, are we happy then to note the assurance performance report for February? Yeah, yeah. and acknowledge the actions being taken. Uh, and note the work being undertaken to review the IPR metrics. Okay, colleagues, then we'll move on to item 10.2. These are the 3A reports. Uh, usual practice, if that's okay, colleagues, I'll ask the chairs of the report if there's anything they wish to escalate or bring to the attention of the board. We have the minutes and we have the chair's report in our pack. So should we start with audit, Tony? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll um, the, the report. Uh, Chair's report and the minutes speak for themselves, but just a couple of points. Um, as you can see in point one, we've had the draft head of internal audit opinion for 23-24, which is substantial assurance. Obviously, we're waiting for the finalised opinion to be presented to the committee on the 26th of June, but that's uh, that's good news. Um, you'll also see it too that we um, recommend approval of the proposal to delegate formal approval of the annual audit at the annual report and accounts on the 26th of June. By the audit committee on behalf of the board of directors to ensure the audit report and that's a recommendation in the uh, and the bundle of the papers today um in terms of reference on the agenda the final point i would ask is around the internal audit plan and anti-fraud work plans for 24 25 were also approved um and i just want to put on record thanks to all the officers and uh, partners involved in the committee um it's uh, it's a good process that we have in place. Thank you. There's a recommendation to the board related to the report. We're asked to delegate approval and submission to the audit committee of the finalised annual report and accounts for 23-24. Happy with that? Yeah. Hey, thank you. Any questions on the audit committee papers? No, Tony, thank you. Thank you. Finance and performance. We've got apologies from Amin, but he has sent an email, which um, we will put in the minutes through the company secretary. But he said that um, while month 11 position was stated as 17.5 million deficit, as per the briefing month 12, uh, they're awaiting obviously the audit, which we've just referred to. But the planned deficit of the year was 18.3. National funding of 17.8 million to reduce the deficit, restated a plan of 0.5 million deficit. So the Finance uh, Committee looked at that. Um, we also looked at the 24 25 plan and approved the plan to the Board of Directors. Um, so they are recommended that we adopt the 24 25 plan moving to this committee. So I'll just take that as a formal proposal to the Board. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and any comments on the finance report? Scott? Just one chair from me. On page 312, there's a um, comment at bullet point five, um, which I think is positive in that it shows triangulation between the performance accountability framework and the QGAF. Um, but I mean, not say um, that the committee noted, the FP committee noted um, the VTE compliance. Um, and that's for a further report. It also references a quality committee. So I just wonder if there's a triangulation piece between FP and quality around who's got primacy for the VTE piece. Is that a question? It's a request, I suppose, between the quality no, committee and engineering. The relevant chairs of the committees to talk that. I'll come back to you, Scott. Okay. Okay. We accept the FP papers. Yeah. So we move on then the People Committee. Uh, Karen, please. Um, yes, thank you. I think largely taken as, as read and I'm conscious that a couple of the items we've got agendas for later today. So in terms of the staff survey and also the um, report that includes one MSC. Um, just a couple of points to highlight. Um, we particularly noted the improvement in the staff survey in perceived fairness from 
vain colleagues in in respect of recruitment and retention and and so that's extremely positive alongside that the committee approved a recommendation to move towards inclusive recruitment ambassadors to really try to drive improvements across a broader range of protected characteristics um, so the committee are very supportive of that but also continuing to maintain close oversight on those improvements for our BAME colleagues. We want to, have to, to maintain that but improve for others as well. Um, in terms of outputs from the staff survey, and um, we'll hear a bit more later, uh, just some real differences there. So significant improvements for surgery and medicine that were really very, very positive. I'm going to focus now on sustaining those. But we are concerned about the, um, the results, particularly for the women's and children's care group, and that they triangulate very clearly with sickness, absence, and, and colleagues seeking additional occupational health support. So there's a, a strong focus on that through the performance accountability meetings with um, women's and children's care group, but we are, it's an, it's an ongoing area of concern that we really need to maintain and focus on. And just particularly with regard to LSC, um, in terms of that transition, uh, quite assuring that some um, risks in terms of data and data transfer have been identified early. So they've been identified prior to the transfer. So some of that work is just um, on a hold whilst mitigations for those risks are firmly put in place. Um, those are the key things to, to highlight from the um, March meeting. And then unusually, we had a meeting in April that was quite fortuitous. Um, that was just a, a question of kind of diary scheduling. And while there were two items um, around advice and assurance that are in the, um, uh, the report there, it's just to say that we had a really well facilitated workshop so thanks particularly to you for facilitating that because online facilitation with breakout rooms is quite technical wizardry and it worked really well and that was particularly focused on the bath on risks and on risk appetite so really useful and um, really positive feedback about that workshop and, and we'll see some of the outputs of that later today as well so those are the key points thank you okay thank you Move on then. Do we accept the report? Yeah, yeah happy. Then we'll move on. Quality committee, Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. I'll introduce you in a sec. Thank you. Um, we've had uh, meeting agendas at Quality Assurance Committee, so I'll try to be brief. Um, we discussed at the last board, um, last public board, uh, that, that we were concerned that potentially there'd been um, a, a, run of ne a, a greater run of never events than previously and had asked for some additional information on that. We received a report at the meeting of Quality Assurance Committee in April um, and that identified that a main theme was around wrong site surgery um, and that we are not an outlier in terms of the national picture for wrong site surgery. There's also a national um, review going consultation taking place around what should be counted as a never event, because um, obviously it follows very prescribed criteria. Um, and so that's likely to um, impact potentially on, on what our never events going forward. Uh, so we need to wait for the outcome of that, but we were reassured that um, don't have an underlying theme. So we've received the report from the ICB. Um, there has been a discussion at ICB. We are awaiting the report from that um, to, to look at any, any further information. Um, I wanted to come back to your point, Aaron, about the maternity sustainability plan. So we did, of course, consider that at the April meeting um, and we looked at that in detail and we noted that the maternity improvement supervisor had, had uh, commented that it was a comprehensive report with clear action planning in place. And we agreed that the committee will receive a quarterly update on the progress of the maternity sustainability plan. Um, we received, I've received a report, a report on um, triangulation between patients who do not meet the criteria to reside, so are stranded in our care and potential harm. Uh, that was a, a deep dive undertaken around the experience of patients and that provided us with assurance that patients are not um, unduly coming to harm whilst they do not meet criteria to reside. So that was 
reassuring. Um, what it un uncovered is that we need to do some more work to understand the impact of de deconditioning for patients while they remain in our care. Because um, starting to look at place of, potential place of discharge at the point at which a patient is considered ready for discharge versus point at which they're actually discharged there, there was sometimes a shift there so that's another piece of work um, that, that will continue as part of that um, I wanted to flag an alert from our most, most recent discussion relating to the annual patient experience report um, so in response to a question from a safeguarding colleague um, the committee will be seeking assurance around the robust process for maintaining DBS checks for volunteers. Um, so we were, we we're assured that um, the, the policy, the process for volunteers follows trust DBS policy, um, but we also are aware that there's a wider um, piece of work going on around that. So the committee will be looking for some, some great, great assurance on that. Um, and I think those were the key points I was going to cover. Thank you. Happy to accept the call to report, colleagues. Sarah, thank you. The next one, the new hospital project committee, uh, two elements of this report. Um, I'll update on the on the committee itself, but then Scott will present a new hospital program quarter four report to this board, but thereafter it will go to the new hospital program. So we just want to close the assurance loop by making sure the quarter four report looks here. Um, there are no alerts because it was the first meeting. Um, we advise we approved the terms of reference and we're working on the work plan for next year. We have the chair and the SRO in place. One assurance, uh, we were assured by the preparation of the land acquisition business case. Uh, happy to answer any questions on the first committee or are you happy to accept the paper? Yeah, thank you. Then we'll move on to, if you could give us a verbal update on uh, quarter four, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I really must pull out from the paper other than, than taking it as read. And the only thing I was going to pull out was the, the point that you made, which this would be the last one. Uh, and the business of this is on the work plan and come through the um, now newly established committee. Thank you. We note that, colleagues. Thank you. That concludes the three A's quality subcommittees. Thank you, colleagues. We'll move on then to the item 11, then we'll have a short break. Sharon, after the break, I'll introduce you, if that's OK. Um, annual operation plan, if I just refer you to the finance subcommittee who recommended to the board that they support and we accept the operational plan. So Chief Finance Officer, please, your item. Yes, Chad, I'll limit my my comment, my explanation really to 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 make sure the board's clear about why this is here. So the board's previously uh, we we previously taken the March uh, plan, uh, operating plan submissions uh, through the appropriate processes. However, after those submissions were prepared, of course, the planning guidance for the 24-25 year was published, I think 28th of March. So um, an additional planning submission was mandated in order that any changes to plans necessary to meet this uh, late notification of requirements would be incorporated into organisational submissions to NHS England. So uh, for this, um, the purpose of bringing this to the board is really to highlight the limited number of changes that the uh, the, the uh, planning guidance required in the UHMB plans. The financial plan value remains unchanged, although the trust will take the opportunity to update the savings plan delivery profile in its financial plan. Uh, to reflect the greater level of detail that we now have available in respect to those plans. Um, the uh, paper itself sets out minor changes um, uh, in the plan. Uh, they relate to emergency department for our standard performance increasing to 78% from 77 and an update on the uh, same day emergency care recording arrangements. There is a useful summary, I hope, of operating plan guidance um, and the uh, UHMB position relative to those requirements, that slides 10 to 31. Um, and also we've included an update on the local commissioning intentions, because of course in time we'll need to weave uh, the requirements of local commissioning int intentions into our plans. They were received on the 16th of April. Um, 
and uh, we will come back on process and content uh, once the full review of those has happened. Um, the key areas of focus are also in the pack just to help uh, articulate how we look to maintain the connection between the detail of our planning activity for the year ahead and our longer strategic, our longer term strategic priorities. And clearly uh, the trust performance will be considered in part against the core elements of the 24-25 operating plan. So I uh, referenced earlier in the meeting uh, the slide that sets out the overview and timetable process, which is of course already underway to refresh the integrated performance report for the new financial year. Uh, when we previously presented the plan for approval, we set out our assessment of the risks contained with the achievement of the plan requirements, and we've updated those for the latest planning guidance in section five of the paper. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And just to remind colleagues, the board did approve one of the early iterations on the March board. It's been seen by FMP in February and also by the board on the 6th of March. So. Um, colleagues, any questions or anything you wish to add? We know the submission is tomorrow. F and P have recommended we accept the report and the plan. Happy to accept that. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, we have discussed it and considered it, Chris, and it should go forward for submission tomorrow. Thank you. OK, colleagues, um, I'm going to call a quick morning break before we move on to people and organisational development. Um, 10 minutes, you happy with that? Shall we reconvene at 25 past? Yeah.